The Bergen-Belsen concentration camp is one of the five most terrible camps in the history of the Third Reich. Originally established in 1940 as a camp for prisoners of war, French, Belgian and British, the camp became a place of the residence for about 600 prisoners. Later, gypsies and political prisoners were also brought there. And after the attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, about 20,000 Soviet prisoners of war were delivered to Bergen-Belsen, of which a little more than 2,000 survived a year later. In 1943, a special zone was equipped on the territory of the camp, in which only wealthy Jewish prisoners were kept. The leaders of the Germany assumed that it would be a so-called exchange fund in order to return from captivity of the Allies their own officers, who ended up in the hands of the British, French or Americans. It was also assumed that the captured officers and soldiers of the countries of the anti-Hitler coalition held in the camp would also be exchanged. However, in practice, there were only a few real cases of such exchange. The structure of the camp was quite simple eight zones isolated from each other, each of which contained its own category of prisoners. But no matter how terrible it sounds, until 1944, living conditions in the camp were relatively, so to speak, humane. Since the beginning of 1944, Bergen-Belsen received the status of so-called rehabilitation camp, where prisoners were sent who were no longer able to perform any work, the sick, crippled, weakened and dying. And at the same time, two of the most terrible and famous executioners were transferred to the service in the Bergen-Belsen. Joseph Kramer, nicknamed the Belsen Beast, and his combat girlfriend, Irma Gries, the most ruthless and terrible warden, who received the nickname Fair-Haired Devil from the prisoners. Naturally, rehabilitation meant the fastest possible disposal of prisoners who no longer represented a value as a labor force. Therefore, Kramer, together with Greece, introduced to the unfortunate and sick people all their skills acquired in other concentration camps. Prisoners were constantly beaten for and without reason, setting dogs loose on them. At the request of this couple, the marching prisoners could be shot from a machine gun, or they simply enjoy watching the dogs tear the unfortunate people apart. And in order to speed up the process of dying prisoners as much as possible, Kramer brought living conditions from a terrifying to a monstrous state. The surviving prisoners said that hell was heaven compared to the Bergen-Belsen camp. As one of the survivors of the so-called Jewish zone wrote, it was unbearably hot there, probably from a huge crowd of people. Soon it began to rain, water seeping through the holes on us. My sister and I huddled together under our blankets, just like Anna and Margot. They looked like dying birds. It was painful to look at them. Anna and Margot presumably died in the spring of 1945, during a typhus epidemic that broke out in the camp. From the moment the liberation of Europe began, prisoners from other camps – Auschwitz, Majdanek, etc. – were transferred to Bergen-Belsen. The transfer was carried out as part of the so-called death marches. So even before arriving in Bergen-Belsen, thousands, if not tens of thousands of prisoners died on the roads. From December 1944 to March 1945, at least 45,000 prisoners arrived in the camp. From the terrible congestion, inhumane conditions of detention and constant bullying, which was documented later, several thousands people died in the camp every day. Therefore, the area was very quickly filled with corpses which simply could not be buried promptly. And here the special cynicism of the commandant of the camp Kramer manifested itself. Arriving in Bergen-Belsen, he did not part with his musical passions. Therefore, as in previous places of service, he quickly gathered prisoners who knew how to play musical instruments. Additionally, he took with him the orchestra he had formed in the auschwitz now concentration camp. As a rule, the musical troupe performed in the front of the guests of the concentration camp, or to please the ears of the guards. The total number of musical troops is not known for certain, but according to the memoirs of the prisoners, there were two brass bands, a classical group, by the way, Lily made the famous Hungarian violinist 
and Fiora Schreiber, an accordionist from Holland, played in it, and a kind of gypsy song and dance ensemble. Kramer paid the musician with cigarettes and food. The overcrowding of the camp with prisoners, the lack of food and extreme exhaustion led to a natural ending. In the spring, a typhus epidemic broke out in the camp. People were dying every hour and every minute. The number of dead bodies grew at such an incomprehensible rate that Kramer ordered the living prisoner to dig graves and bury the dead. However, these measures did not bring success. Half-dead prisoners could not dig graves at the required speed, and often those who dug fell into the same grave already dead. But that was the least of the camp commandant's worries. By his order, while the convoy of prisoners were digging graves to bury other prisoners, two brass bands played non-stop. The work continued from sunrise to sunset, so the music played all day long. The cynicism was that under dance or classical compositions, bodies were dragged into the graves, workers fell there, and for the same music, for the sake of entertainment, the guards shot the weakest prisoners but tortured them with dogs. The conditions of the prisoners can be judged from the recollection of the soldiers who entered the camp in April 1945. By the way, Kramer himself remained in it after the surrender of the camp without a fight, allegedly, to maintain order. What he was counting on was unknown. When the soldiers and officers entered the camp, they saw a gruesome scene more reminiscent of the one from hell. Mountains of bodies and exhausted people lying everywhere. Some prisoners died in front of their eyes. What was most striking was the absolute indifference of the prisoners to everything. A woman washed in water in which a corpse of an infant was floating. Another was trying to cook a miserable meal right next to a mountain of bodies. Moreover, in order not to collapse, she leaned directly on these bodies. Suffice it to say that even after the liquidation of the camp, Many thousands of prisoners remained to live on its territory for several more years because they needed a long and painstaking rehabilitation. It is difficult for us to imagine what actually happened in the camp with the prisoners. But for some reason today many people have undeservably forgotten. It would seem an insignificant fact. The soldiers and officers who were the first to enter Bergen-Belsen after the end of the Second World War in fact needed psychological rehabilitation themselves, because what they saw did not fit into any framework of either human or even animal morality. For example, Bernard Maurice Levy, a member of the Royal British Forces, was specially sent to Bergen-Belsen in order to select the living from the thousands of dead and do everything so that they receive medical care. After returning home, all members of the household diligently monitored any press that appeared in the house, immediately removing newspapers and magazines that contained photographs of the concentration camps. The man himself did not even watch television, if at least something was dedicated to these camps. What he saw and experienced in 1945 shocked the 19-year-old boy so much that this wound remained with him until the end of his life. He even slept with the radio on and woke up several times a night. Only at the age of 85, Bernard Maurice Levy decided to tell his family about what he saw there. Everywhere barbed wire, chaos, corpses, skeletons. Actually, they all looked like skeletons. We couldn't help but think about the people who were dying there without help, without food, without treatment in the hospital. We moved the bodies, moved the bodies of people who were still alive, disinfected, and moved them. 